you've probably seen this symbol before, someplace, somewhere, and it's for good reason. This is the symbol called Uruboros, or the serpent or snake devouring its own tail, and has a rather ancient history. If you were to parse it apart, it's based on two ancient Greek words, making it a compound. You have ura, tail, and boros, eating, so the eating of a tail, as it were. And it first emerges in ancient Egyptian mythology, and later on it's passed down through the ages, and many Gnostics in the Christian tradition, as well as alchemists, make use of it. And so it has a storied history. And of course, across the globe, there are many cultures that have stories and myths about serpents. You have the Midgard serpent from Old Norse mythology. You have myths amongst South American Indians. We talk about an anaconda that flanks the sides of the oceans and so forth. So it's not terribly uncommon. But specifically in the Occidental tradition, Uroboros is very much a symbol of renewal, reincarnation, regeneration. That is to say, the serpent that devours itself to be reborn anew, potentially. And historically and traditionally, that has been the general meaning of it. But there's another element here, and this is why I refer to it as a modern interpretation of Uruburos, and that is there are some cases of snakes, actual snakes that exist in the real world, that under particular circumstances related to temperature regulation will in fact mistake their tails for a food source. They will eat themselves, as it were. And it's in this context that I want to talk about what I have been observing of late through investigation and research, if you will, in progressive circles, left-wing circles. Not center-left, but far-left, progressive-left. And that is this observation that essentially what we can observe now is an act of Uruburos, if you will. The serpent, the snake devouring its own tail. But not in an act of regeneration or reincarnation or rebirth, but rather plain old cannibalism. And the reason why this has happened particularly in an online context, because so much of the politics these days does take place online, is because, frankly speaking, most of the right-wing opposition has been purged. And if they haven't been purged, they are afraid to offer any opposition for fear of being purged. This is a product of many things, cancel culture, limits on what you can say for fear of being banned, etc., etc. But how do we, in fact, arrive at this Uruburian moment? Well, I think the internet has been instrumental here because the internet has mobilized political forces like we have never seen before. And as a consequence, the internet has allowed people to spread varying messages that much more quickly. And because the left has essentially won the culture war, they are able to create platforms and trends that set the tone and set the stage for everything that you're allowed to say, everything you're encouraged to say, and the things that you are flat out not allowed to say. But there's an interesting phenomenon that occurs because left and right, which a lot of people would describe as polar opposites, I do think it's a little bit more complicated, it's often been hypothesized they need each other, right? Because the right, historically, would blame the left for whatever deficiencies might exist in any kind of social human setting. And the left, to this day, blames the right for whatever deficiencies they observe or to their minds in the progressive circles that I've been studying, it is the right, even in its current impotent, weakened incarnation, actively preventing some of the progressive policies that they would like to see enacted. And so it's always a blame game. The world isn't perfect, but we can sort of make it perfect. I'm not saying that's what everyone says. We can improve it greatly, but there's an obstacle. And the obstacle is not human nature itself or anything you can observe or some external variable that just prevents us from getting to where we want to get, it's the opposition. It's the people who think differently. It's the others. It's a very common theme throughout all of human history. It's nothing new. But the difference is that quote-unquote right-wing voices are increasingly few these days 
And to the extent that they do exist, they don't offer any legitimate opposition to progressive policies, cultural changes, et cetera, et cetera. Again, the left has functionally, and I would argue fundamentally, won the culture war. And so there's not much left to be said on that. Anything the left wants will eventually be made a reality within reason. We could debate what some of those limits might be. But as the right has basically fizzled out of existence as an actual wall of opposition that that the left could blame and point fingers at, there has arisen a problem. And I've noticed this in my studies, particularly of Destiny podcast. Now, I'm not a huge fan of Destiny by any means. But a short while ago, I became interested in just what these people were talking about and saying. What were they discussing? What were the sorts of topics that animated them? And needless to say, the topics that animated them are of absolutely no interest to me whatsoever, typically. They just don't cross my radar. But I nonetheless listen. And there was a roundtable discussion, if you will, amongst progressives on a stream whereby they were discussing the problem of finding people to debate. This is what they love to do, debate people endlessly. And the fact that the right-wing people have either been purged or gone, and the others just don't want to bother or come on. And that this is a problem, and so many of them, Destiny included, have been reduced to debating fellow people on the left, because that's all that is left, so to speak, no pun intended. And it's an interesting observation, because it sort of mimics the symbolism of what I referred to earlier that actually can happen in the real world in case of some snakes. And the snake is not necessarily a representation of the left. I'm not using it to suggest they're serpentine per se. But if there are no prey items under the right circumstances, a snake can, in fact, attack its own tail. And I think the lack of prey items is becoming an issue for the left and has been for quite some time. In fact, this has been pointed to by many people, this idea that the left increasingly has sought out fantasy dragons to slay, whether they're there or not, or to the extent that they do exist, they're so minuscule such as to not be a threat. That's what they do do when they point out to the right, blocking this and blocking that. It sometimes strikes me as living in a completely different reality, but there you have it. Or the left gets into the nitty-gritty details of all of their progressive politics and the minutia of what they disagree about. And so the left then begins debating quite vociferously other people in their camp on the itty-bitty minutia of their own policies because the opposition simply doesn't exist anymore. And the kinds of things they talk about, as I alluded to earlier, are just things that would never cross my radar. Intense discussions about the definition of gender or whether or not biological sex has any effect on gender whatsoever. These are actual discussions that go on for hours and hours, or other discussions that would never cross my radar just because I don't see the utility of them. Another very strange discussion I listened to was whether or not a white man who married a black woman and had children with her could still be racist, and this discussion went on for hours and hours and hours. So you can kind of see the topics that they engage in and they're really passionate about. It's all about identity politics. It's all about deconstructing things not in a scientific way, but in a cultural, sociological way, a very academic way. And frankly speaking, it doesn't make any sense to me having these types of discussions because we have a general sense of how things work in the world. And if you want to get down to the nitty gritty, that's fine. But this is what I'm talking about. The left doesn't really have the right anymore as anything other than a boogeyman. And to be fair, the opposite is always the boogeyman. It's just the boogeyman is impotent, lying on the floor, has no power, has no authority. So they are forced to cannibalize themselves, for want of a better word. And I should say for the record, I don't think this is fundamentally different with regards to the right. I don't think this is a unique aspect of the left, although many right-wing people might claim that. We've seen throughout history different movements, belief systems that gave rise to heresies. In the long tradition of Christianity in the beginning, you had... Arianism, which was a big, big problem for Catholics for centuries and centuries until it was finally gotten rid of. And then much later, in the High Middle Ages, you had Catharism, which is a Gnostic movement within Christianity that the Catholic Church vigorously persecuted and tried to get rid of as well. So you always have 
these heresies within heresies. But the problem within the modern left is as it's cannibalizing itself, it is also going to cannibalize the more centrist and or mild elements because it's always the extreme that typically wins and it's always the extreme that wants to get rid of whatever they decide as too orthodox. In fact, in the self-same discussion, it was Destiny who was arguing that there was, in fact, a correlation between biological sex and gender. And the opposition was coming down on him quite harshly. And Destiny is not a conservative person. He's not even left of center. He's a progressive. But increasingly, he's observed that the left is moving further and further from reality by making all sorts of strange proclamations. And he's the type of guy, I think, eventually, that will be purged too for some kind of heresy that doesn't conform to the most purest interpretation of orthodoxy within progressive circles. And it's going to happen probably to everyone. Remember, the extremes typically win, whatever the extreme might be. And so as a consequence, we should be afraid in some sense, because if we know in all likelihood that the most extreme elements of the left will win, and they will cannibalize and purge the other members of the left, vis-a-vis -vis cancel culture, etc., etc., then anyone who doesn't belong to the left, well, in such a case, there's nothing left to say. I think a lot of these people in these circles are misguided, to say the least, but I put this out there. If your only tool, your only weapon is fear, and you wish people to shut up, to hush up, and not say the things they think, that could work, but you're not going to convert people. Very few people, I suspect, that are reluctant to say things because it could easily be misinterpreted by some of the most extreme elements on the left are actual conversion cases. They're just people who are afraid to say certain things, frankly speaking. And we all know what that feeling is like in the current atmosphere and the current cultural divide. And so it will be interesting to observe how this modern Ouroboros process proceeds and what ultimately happens with it. I don't think it bodes well for anyone but I am reasonably confident in saying that this cannibalization process will be accelerated and it will get more and more extreme. Anyway, thank you for tuning in. Please hit the like button if you've not yet done so. Likewise, the subscribe button. Hit the bell icon to be informed of forthcoming videos. And as always, if I'm still alive, I'll check you out later. May the gods watch over you. Take care and bye-bye. If you liked this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.